Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute is a great exercise to get you out of the sagittal plane and into the frontal, and that is the K-Box lateral squat. With one leg off the box, you're going to give the wheel a spin and really sink into the hip of the leg that's on the box. While you're doing this, you want to try to keep that back leg straight to really stretch out those adductors and really drive your pelvis as hard as you can up and over to the side off the box. Make sure you give yourself a counterweight with this because when you give the K-Box a good push here, it's going to want to give a little bit. So make sure you set yourself up there. But this is really an awesome exercise, again, to get you out of that sagittal plane, open up your hips. Guys, give this one a try. I'm sure it's one you're going to love. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat? Well, you could find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well, all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over a hundred different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash C-V-A-S-P-S to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Mike, this has been a long time coming, brother. I'm glad we finally got this down. Yeah, I've been I've been asking you when I was going to come on, I think, for the past year now. Yeah. It, <laughs> it might even be longer if we're being totally honest, dude. But stoked we can get this down. Stoked we can catch up. And uh, I'm really fired up for this. But for the freaking quarter of a human being, who doesn't know who you are and where you're at. Let's give them the quick little intro and everything about how you got up to Jersey, bud. Okay. So I started off as a DeFranco athlete, Joe DeFranco. I was, I was his box jump guy that started off doing all that shit. But even prior to that, I mean, my dad, my dad was a Louis Simmons guy. He was, I mean, he's a skinny, he's a skinny finance dude, but he learned about training and started reading powerlifting magazines and and came on to louis simmons like back in like 96 96 or 97 it was that early because my brother i was in like fourth grade and my brother was in eighth grade at the time so he I, i'd always hear louis simmons in the background it was like those echoey videos and i got really into working out at that point Coming into high school, ended up meeting DeFranco, heard he did West Side for Skinny Bastards. Like, oh, Louis Simmons. And I said to him, like, oh, do you guys do the Paul Dix press? I said something stupid like that when, when I was like 16 years old. He goes, what the fuck do you know about the Paul Dix press? Oh, am I allowed to curse, by the way? Yeah, why not? I'll just put a sticker on it. <laughs> um, he said, what the hell do you know about that? I was like, I, I talked to him about Louis Simmons. And then we kind of became friends after that. He's like, all right, you want to come in and train? I said, cool. So I started training with Joe DeFranco. And I was there for years. I became, I don't know, I guess, I guess I was like a YouTube celebrity before there were YouTube celebrities. I might be, we, we're going to have to fact check this. I may be the first box jump video on YouTube. I don't know, but I, it, it's, it's, it's that, uh, right? Like I, it was that long ago that, that I did, that I did that box jump that went viral at the time. And then I also started training guys out of Joe's, Joe's place when I was in college still. Uh, Joe had a handful of trainers there and one guy didn't show up for a session one day. And I know Joe's program at the time. I knew it inside and out. And he goes, listen, I don't have time to train this guy. Uh, his coach didn't show up. Do you want to train him? I said, fuck yeah, I do. So I started training guys uh, here and there. And I don't even, I mean, I didn't even add, I don't think I asked for money when I first started training, training guys. I was like, yo, dude, I'll just, I'll just fucking train him. I don't care. And then he started paying me. Um, and at the time, like I'm in, I'm in college, like making, making good money for, you know, a college kid training guys in an inside and out nonstop as frequently as I possibly could while bouncing 
uh, on, on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And that's how I made my money. And then I graduated college. And the second I graduated, I was working full-time for Joe that entire summer. Then once I graduated, uh, finished that summer, I decided I was going to go to Pittsburgh to intern with Buddy and James, uh, Buddy Morris and James the Thinker Smith. So at this point, I think I had been with DeFranco for five or six years. And I, I knew Joe's program. I grew up a West Side guy. I knew West Side for skinny bastards. So to me, that's, yeah, that's all there was. It, 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 that's, to me, that was my world. So I had hit up Buddy and James and I was like, I'd, I'd love to intern for you. Joe says great things about you guys. And I, I really didn't give a shit about interning for James at the time. I was like, this guy's a fucking Russian nerd. Like, I don't, I, I don't want to. I don't want to hear what he has to say. It doesn't make sense to me. So I, I even said that in the email. I was like, if I could just email, if I could just intern for Buddy and not James, I, I'd be very cool with that. So they, James was very polite. He says, we don't do that. It's always a, a, you know, a joint internship, but I'll keep that in mind. So my first meeting with them, James sat me down and very eloquently motherfucked me up and down uh, and let me know how much I don't know. And it made me feel like that big and I wanted to leave because I was like, this guy's just, he's too smart. So what I learned with Buddy and James turned my world upside down. I was there, I don't know, five, five months or so, something like that. I was there for the entire football season. And it was, it was life-changing for me. So from what I had learned prior to, to DeFranco from my father, then what I learned with DeFranco, then, I mean, if, if all that was like, a real undergraduate degree in strength conditioning. What I got with Buddy and James was like the master's PhD. And it was, it, it, it changed everything. So I went back to DeFranco's for, this was 2009 or 2010. And I had worked there for another four years. And we kind of started changing some programs around. Joe decided he wanted to move his gym down to Texas with Onnit. Asked me if I wanted to go. I said, I'm not going to Texas. Like there's, there's no way I'm going to Texas. Like I, it, it's just not for me. He said, okay, no problem. I ended up starting my own gym, Freak Strength, which I actually never wanted to do. I never wanted to be a business owner, but I, I just did it because I was kind of on my ass without a job. And then, yeah, here I am. So uh, once I started Freak Strength, uh, things were going real well. I started getting a lot of pro athletes. My, my pro athlete resume is like, through the roof now compared to what it was and what we did at DeFranco's. And it started not getting dry, but I, I, I was looking for something more. So in my time there, and, and I started, uh, I, I, I had learned, by the way, uh, I went to CVAPS, which to me was, I, I went there once or twice. And, and to me, it was the epitome of where all the best lecturers go. If you're a great coach, you go there. So my goal has always been like, I, I, I want my, I, I, I'd like to write a book published by uh, Ultimate, Ultimate Athlete Concepts. Is that what it is? I'd, I want to write a book that they publish because they have like, you know, Verkashansky and they, they, they have Yeses and Bondarchuk. They have all these guys that they publish and I want to speak at CVAPs. So those were like, if, if I could do these things, that was like the mother load for me. So at CVAPS one year, I ran into Cal Dietz and he lectured there and he started talking some stuff. I liked what he had to say. He was high energy. Some things I questioned, but I bought his book, Triphasic. And I read a fuck ton of that. I read that two or three times to try to make sense of a lot of things. And he did a great job doing it. And I got into Cal and we started talking and then Cal released the RPR, Reflexive Performance Reset years later. And they said, oh, it's neurological. I said, what's, what's going on with this? It's neurological, but it's also fascial and it's this and it's that. And I, people started talking about fascia, 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 fascia. And I, I was like, okay, fuck it. I, I want to learn about fascia. Where do I go to learn about fascia? And everything kind of pointed me towards acupuncture. So if anyone knows acupuncture, if anyone knows fascia, it'd be an acupuncture. So like, okay, I'll just go to acupuncture school. So that's 151 credits. I did an entire schooling of acupuncture for my master's. And then I have another nine classes to take for my doctorate. And then I learned all about acupuncture, all about fascia through acupuncture, strictly because of the RPR. 
and I wanted to like really dive into that. And now I just grad I, in December, I just graduated my master's program and I haven't started my doctorate yet, but that's where I am right now. And my business is taking off. My business has every single year grown, grown like clockwork, even when I was in acupuncture school. So it was, it was really tough. I was putting in hundred hour weeks pretty routinely, but it is what it is. Like, you know, you just, just got to man up and, and do the shit, but that's, that's who I am. That's how I started. And that's where I am. Yeah, dude. And I think that coming to this full circle back up with the acupuncture stuff, I think that this is an interesting topic to touch upon because you know, like Hank has talked about how there's a reason why and he uses acupuncture and yoga as the examples are still around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And that's because they work. So my argument to that now, keep in mind, I have a master's in acupuncture, but my argument to that is there's a lot of things that have been around for hundreds of years, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism. There's a lot of religions. I mean, rape, murder, theft, all these things have been around for thousands of years. It doesn't make them right. Okay. So, so I, that's, I don't, I don't think that's it. And, and a lot of my teachers, my professors would say that to me, like, Hey, this has lasted thousands of years for a reason. Like, well, I, listen, that's a terrible, that's a terrible argument for me, but there are aspects of it that, that do work. Yeah. And then there's aspects that I think are important in the training realm because it's brought to light some things that we probably need to do better. Yes. So from a soft tissue perspective, I deal dealing with these high caliber athletes that I have now you know, between professional athletes, Olympic athletes, we, we train, we, we train all these guys and girls at a very, very high level. And I started realizing that there was only so much that I can do from a training standpoint, because if you have a coach, that's just going to overload them. It doesn't matter what I'm doing in the friggin' weight room. As long as I keep it conservative in the weight room, it's almost like a less is more right. And, and, and a lot of our coaches uh, strength coaches want, need to justify their existence. And the only way they can do that isn't by on the field play. It's through bench squat deadlift. It's what are the numbers in, in the weight room, which is, uh, I understand it. I get it. But there's only so far we can push that before we start injuring people, uh, especially in the college and professional level. So what it started, with, and since working with pros, I realized that you know, the, the best ability is availability. I have, I have Devin McCourty, who's a potential Hall of Famer. And we, we just went over this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he, I think in, in 12 years, he's missed five games, right? That's, it's, it's incredible. He's, it, that's, that's, that's unheard of. Now, he missed his five games in five, the first five years of his career, where I think he had, he rolled an ankle or someone hit him weird and, and, a separated shoulder or something, you know, like uncontrollable stuff. But one of the reasons why he's going to be considered for this is because he had more defensive snaps in the last decade than any other player, any other player in the NFL. No one has had as many defensive snaps as Deb McCourty. And he happened to be on the most winningest team in the last decade, the Patriots. So because of his availability, his ability to stay healthy and on the field and, and his stats aren't outrageous. Like you look at a statue, like, ah, not really a hall of famer, you know, not a ton of interceptions, not a ton of tackles, but great team doesn't come off the field with a great team. I mean, things like that really add up. So dealing with these guys, the only thing I could really control was how they felt, not necessarily how fast they got or how strong they got, because I, I could influence that, but at a cost. So the ways that I actually got them better was by making them feel better constantly. So then I started getting deeper into the body work. Uh, and, and it started me on the, the path that I'm at right now where the weight room, it's not irrelevant. It's absolutely not irrelevant. It, it, you need it, but it's not as critical. I don't think is as critical as making sure these, and, and for high level athletes, making sure these high level athletes feel good. Because there's only, I mean, these guys are the best athletes in the world, the absolute best athletes in the world. So how much better am I going to make them 
at their sport through bench squat deadlift or through a single leg squat or through a posterior chain movement, right? If I can make them feel better on a routine basis, that's the key. When I, when I trained uh, Kevin Love, I trained him four days before one of his seasons started. When we first met, it was only four days before he left and we had four workouts. So what are you going to do with a guaranteed Hall of Famer when you just meet the guy? What, am I going to have him fucking clean? Am I going to have him do maximum sprints? Like, absolutely fucking not. So we did a ton of Eldoa stretches. I did a bunch of fascia stretches, like manual fascial stretching. Uh, we did quality warm-ups before he played. And he started dunking in practice. And the GM and the uh, one of the coaches said, uh, one of the coaches said to me at the time, he was like, uh, he only dunks when, when he feels good. Like this is, this is incredible. We, I, I haven't seen him. And the guy's been there for, you know, three or four years at that time. He goes, I never see him dunk in practice. The only time he ever dunks is when he feels good. And Kevin walked up to him. He said, I feel like me again. Right. So did I make him bigger, stronger, faster? And did that make him better? No. Our job with these elite level athletes is to make them feel like them, make them feel good again, because they've been playing for so damn long that they don't know what that feels like. Devin McCourty, year in and year out now, usually gets in the top five fastest plays in the NFL. When he gets an interception, runs downfield, and he always hits, I don't know, 21 miles an hour or so every single year. It doesn't get any faster. He's not hitting 22, right? I'm not improving his speed, but I'm enabling him to feel good year in and year out so he can constantly perform. And it, I mean... His, he nicknamed himself Wolverine because the guy just never gets hurt. And if he does, he, he heals it all the time. So I, how much of that is me? I don't know. But my goal with these guys is to make them feel better. Well, I would almost argue that, I mean, there's a guy who's gotten older and not gotten better. But the fact that he's gotten older and not gotten worse means you've gotten him better. Sure. Yeah. I, there, there's, it, it very well could be, right? And I had um, a defensive end, Justin Tradow, who physically got worse every single year because he's, the, I mean, you know, the NFL, they call them high motor white guys. Um, it's, you know, that's, that's, it's, if, if, you know, so that's, he's, he's one of those guys that just crushed his body. And every single day he treated it like a, uh, a warrior mentality. He'd even sit there and he'd meditate. I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior. That's how, that's who he was. And he, he was a, he played for urban Meyer. He played during the, um, uh, the Tebow era. So he won, he, he's won a super bowl. He's won a national championship. He played at Don Bosco with coach toll and, uh, Nunzio Campanelli and they're psychos. They beat people into the ground. So for eight years prior to the NFL, he got beat up by Urban Meyer, and then he got beat up by, by Coach Toll. And for people that know how brutal Urban Meyer workouts are, Tradow said playing at Bosco was harder than playing at Florida. So, and this guy played, was a grinder. I think he played seven years in the NFL. And the only reason, and his body got worse every single year. And the only reason he was able to continue playing was because at a high level, was because his skill developed. And that only happens with time. So if we can get him onto the field to the best of his ability, he can develop his talent as well. So these, these are things that need, I, I think need to be considered. Yeah. And I couldn't agree more because I think that, I think that that's kind of twofold. I think that the, the reason that things get pushed too far is because of the ever present fear that we have in our little corner of sport that, we might not matter. So we have to prove that we matter. And it could be your squat went up or your vertical went up or your bench went up or your body weight went up or like, who cares? Like any metric we can prove, but what we can't prove proves the wrong word. I think you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. What we can't display is that four days of stretching and going slow and not breaking them and working on things so that they feel better so they can practice at a higher level 
are what impact the most important thing of all important things, and that is their ability to work on skill and technical tactical abilities. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll agree with that. Um, there's there, man. Now now I'm lapsing. I'm completely forgetting what I wanted to say. I made a really good point before in my head. Let's let's move past this. <laughs> okay. So, but it's <laughs> but that's it though, right? Because it's like especially older guys, especially higher level guys, you can do way more negative than you can positive by getting them into like what you're the guy you were talking about before, getting them into a grinder state where you wear them down and break them down and you're not building them up and getting them to feel better so that they can do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. When the, with, with the older guys, with the older guys, it's all about making them feel good. Now it, it really sucks. And this is the point that I was just about to make was with the justification of our existence, how do we quantify it? And how much do we even matter? Who, who was in the national championship two years ago? For football was Ohio state was in it. Yeah. I'm guessing it was Ohio state. And, Alabama. and, and the year before was Ohio state. It was, it, it was a year before like with Joe Burrows was Ohio state and um, LSU or something like that. Right. Not Joe Burrows, whoever the hell the guy was. Oh yeah. Know. Joe Burrow. Yeah. Two years ago it was, it was Joe Burrow against uh, Ohio state. Yeah. Right. And urban Meyer was not the coach two years ago, but three years ago, urban Meyer was the head coach. And they were in the they were in the um, the national championship. Well, Alabama was in the national championship one year, and then the following year they were also in the national championship. But they did it without the same sk- uh, strength coach. Scott Cochran went to some other school. So those are two examples where back to back years schools had a repeat of high level of play, high level of execution. And clearly less injuries than typical. Otherwise they wouldn't make it up to that level where you don't need the head coach that you thought you needed and you don't need the strength coach that you thought you needed. So what do you need? You just need recruiting and money. So, I mean, how much, if there's any way not to, to justify how you don't need us, I think those, those examples are, are pretty key. Now, obviously that's, that's an oversimplification, but how much does, the strength coach really matter when you have high level players. I don't know. As, as long as you're not killing these guys, as long as you're not destructing them, how much do they matter? Well, that's kind of the billion dollar question, right? Because I mean, and, and billion with a B because that's like how much it's spent in sport each year, you know, like, I guess it then goes back to, what is truly our role and how can we qualify what we do before we quantify it, right? Because I think that all too often people like to hang their hat on, well, it's injury reduction. Okay, but let's say Kevin goes up, grabs a rebound, lands on a foot, blows an ankle. What are you going to do? Like, Mm -hmm. so now all of a sudden... Does Guadango suck because he blew his ankle? Because he land because you know Isaac Newton had an apple hit him on the head. You know, like you go down, you land on a foot. Bad things can happen. You know, like I think that that's an area too that leads to part of that paranoia is because we look at things and we're like, this is a great idea. This could help, and then we don't think it all the way through, and we say things like injury reduction or even like more generic like do no harm like there's stairs in my weight room someone could fall down the stairs like (laughs) like dude like what did we do like he wasn't paying attention and he missed a step like like you're not doing anything to harm the kid i mean it's not like you're telling him stand on a swiss ball swing a body blade and like try to catch a med ball like you're not doing stupid stuff but Dumb things happen. 
Yeah. And, and even in a sport like football, where no matter what you do, five to 10% of the team of, of the players on the field will be injured. No matter what you do, that's, it's a high impact sport. And there's, and, and to be honest with you, the fact that Devin McCourty only missed five games in 12 years, that's fucking, a lot of that has to do with luck. And the fact that he's not willing to sacrifice his body to the gods with huge hits, it's, it's responsibility. Whereas, you know, he's, he's going to wrap you and roll. Right. So I, he's not, he's not, not going to pull a Brian Cushing where he's going head on and trying to fucking knock your helmet off. So a lot of that has to do with it too. What style of play you are. And if you're that style of player, what are we going to do to save you in the weight room? And I don't think there is something that's, that's, that's not. So hanging your hat on even injury prevention is I, or, or injury reduction is overlooked. I saw a video uh, and, and sprinting mechanics to me, they're, they're not foreign. I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm a decent sprint coach and I'm, I do like an 80, 20 rule where 20% of the effort gives you 80, 80% of the results. And in sports like basketball and football, it's romantic to think that coaching, in my opinion, coaching every little bit of sprinting is going to be optimal. Hey, we got to get the toe off and, and the heel. And, and, you know, like the, it, we have these guys for, let's say I have these guys for six months, which I don't. I'll probably get, or five months, which, which I don't. Last year I did during COVID. And with one of my guys, the most sessions that I ever got with one of my NFL guys was 77 sessions. Well, half of them are going to be sprint sessions if we're lucky. So we're talking 30, 35 to 34 sprint sessions that I'm doing with these guys. Uh, excuse me, 30, 30 to 34 sprints or 38 sprint sessions that I'm going to do with these guys. I don't know how much am I really going to change in 35 or 40 sessions or even 50 sessions? How much a buddy, buddy always used to say it takes 500 hours to invoke a change in motor pattern. Uh, so if I'm sprinting with these guys every single time and worrying about these mechanics, how much does it matter? I don't know. Now I was watching a video where people were discussing uh, excessive backside mechanics and having to stress more front side mechanics. I get that. Uh, too much backside mechanics could lead to hip flexor pulls or premature cramping of the hamstring contraction of the hamstring. And when you swing through, it could, while it's cramped up in that in are contracted in that state, pulling through for the eccentric could, could lead to a pull. I get that. I asked one of the coaches, I said, did you guys have excessive hip issues, groin issues, or hamstring issues last year, hip flexor, groin, or hamstring? He said, no. I said, so why work on it? Because the research is suggesting that this is going to lead to less injuries. I said, but even last year, you didn't really have that many injuries, right? And these are the type of injuries that would come up. So I don't know. Um, I, 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 I'm very minimalistic in my, in my approach to things where it's like, how much am I really going to fix? How much am I really going to put my hands on and how much can I really impact? So if I get these guys stressing about certain things right now, is it worth it? And will it even carry over to them running on the field? Because it probably won't. So how much, how much of all the running mechanics do I even bother going crazy over? And like I said, 20% of the effort gives you 80% of the results. I'm a minimal effective dose. So I give really vague, big cues, big, 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 big benchmark cues to these guys that try to yield the biggest bang for the buck. And I think that's the only way you can do it too. Cause I mean, even more so when you're talking basketball, like you're taking like four hard steps, right? Like unless you're out in transition, which happens, I mean, even a pressing team happens, what, maybe five times, 10 times a game where you're really running. Like, I don't know. Like I, I'm with you there, man. I think that there's some, there's some strength, if you will, in like sprinting because it's important. It helps with all of the things. Again, we could get into the rant that Buddy would go into about ground contact and yada, yada, yada. 
it's going to help with acceleration because if you can run faster, you can accelerate better, yada, yada, yada. But also, if they don't ever do it, what are you preparing them for to do it? And are you preparing them? Are you setting them up for failure by preparing them to do it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. The, it, another thing that I think about too, let's, let's say with a sport like basketball, sprinting mechanics, how much do they matter? How many pulled hamstrings are there in basketball? How many, how many injuries are associated with running? that you'd have to really amend and how much of a difference can you make by amending by, by, by fixing and bringing you to optimal sprint mechanics. I say that like with quotations, cause who the fuck knows what optimal really is um, to bringing them with optimal sprint mechanics. If they've never had any running related injuries in their sport and how much faster will they get in that cruising situation more so than if they were just doing what they were normally doing. Uh, one of the things that we can go over is landing mechanics, but even then there's, I don't know what proper landing mechanics are either. So there's, there's schools of thought with landing mechanics where, yeah, you want to be on your toes and you want to land, land on your toes and you want to be springy. Like I think someone posted like some, some video of like an African tribe doing like all the jumps and staying springy. They're on their toes the whole damn time. They don't, their heels don't touch the ground. Whereas if you talk to some really elite level track and field coaches, they'll tell you, you want a whole footed landing or cl as close to a whole footed landing as you can get. Why? Well, if, if for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, smaller surface area is more pounds per square inch that you need to overcome in that little area. So it's a little too much. If you go whole foot, larger surface area, it disperses the force. Another reason, if you're in plantar flexion, you're going to go more calf and quad. If you're dorsiflexion, you're going to more tib ant and hamstring. But if you're neutral, you're going to contract agonist and antagonist simultaneously. Another reason, the ankle isn't strongest in plantar flexion. It's not strongest in dorsiflexion. It's strongest in neutral. So those are three big reasons why you would want to go whole footed landing. But you're looking at some of these people that are barefoot nonstop. No one taught them how to move, but they're all springing through the roof and they stay on their toes. So I don't even know what the fuck the right thing is to do, even though I utilized logic and physics to confirm my bias in regards to proper, proper landing mechanics versus what I actually see humans doing. So I don't know what the fucking right thing to do is, so why am I gonna overcoach something? Well, people overcoach it because of exactly what you said, so that they can get their confirmation bias so that what they think is right, they can show to be right in whatever way going back to our bench went up, our squat went up, our jump went up, whatever it is, so that we can puff our chest up and prove that we did something. So that's justification for us having a position. So I don't fucking know. So because of all this stuff, what do I do? I focus on them feeling good. How can I get them to feel better? So after all, and, and again, I mean, I, I commented one of uh, Cressy's posts two, three weeks ago, maybe, maybe a month ago, I don't know. He was talking about when people go into uh, hyper lumbar extension, right? Uh, lord, lordosis, and they contract the spinal erectors instead of contracting the glutes to go into hip extension. Some of the fastest people on earth, Michael Johnson, is hyperlordotic. And you can see in one of the, the still shots, his spinal erectors squeezing so hard when he's at top speed. And then you look at someone like Michael Phelps, who, uh, Fred, Fred do, you, do you know Fred Duncan, Buddy's, Buddy's nephew? Uh, excuse me, Buddy's stepson, rather. Smart, smart dude. Smart dude. Uh, he made a post about Michael Phelps being in hyperkyphosis. So, and you look at some of the top deadlifters in the world, they pull from a kyphotic position. Like, and, and it's, it's a sports adaptation. It's optimal. And these guys don't have, I mean, it's a sports adaptation. So there's going to be some manipulations to it, but this is how they perform optimally. This is how they get gold medals and world records. I mean, you see Thor pull, I don't know, 1,100 pounds or some shit during the quarantine, whatever it was. You think he had a neutral spine? Fuck no. No way. 
So if the elite, elite, elite people are doing this, how much does it matter? And that's, that's just structuralism. So I, I don't even know what the hell to look at for good posture. What, what the opt you look at fighters, look at wrestlers, forward head posture, kyphotic posture. Like it's, it's all right there. And this is optimal. I don't know what even optimal posture is. So I'm not going to correct your posture really. Maybe there's some big benchmarks. And if you're in this position and it's causing pain, then we do a cause and effect thing. Like a before and after, does it feel better? Okay, then we'll do this. It's a guess and check. But all I care about is these guys feeling better. And even motor pattern recruitment. If one, one side is asymmetrical and you don't play an asymmetrical sport, we'll address it. But if you do, maybe not. So as long as there's no pain, we kind of maybe just keep it going as is and try to keep them gaining similar strength ratios. I don't know. That's why just fucking feel better. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, that's the big thing, you know, look good, feel good, play good. You know, as simple as that is, I think that is a big thing. And, you know, Mike, I think there's a lot of stuff for people to try to wrap their head around here, but I'd be remiss if we got out of here without talking about another show. So tell us a little bit about Mike and Booker. Let people know where they can find out more. Where can they get the episodes? Where can they they hear you guys go on and on and, and all of those things? Bro, when you said another show, I was like, what the fuck's he talking about? Um, <laughs> so I have a podcast that I started, uh, Mike and Brooker Show. And I, I originally didn't even want to do a podcast, just like I didn't want to open a gym. But it was during quarantine, just like everyone else in the world, I decided to start a podcast. And uh, it's it's catching some speed. We have some awesome guests on it. And it's it's a conversation like this, except it's long form. I mean, most of our podcasts are an hour, hour and a half. Some of them are two hours. Uh, I, I think we got drunk with Cal Dietz on on one of the podcasts. I it was it was brutal. My sleep was fucked for 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 three days after that podcast. I think I had like four glasses of scotch. I'm such a lightweight. Um, <laughs> but we 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 talk we talk about things that we think matter for strength coaches in our opinion uh we just had justice justice gallic on he's the former strength coach for the new york jets and prior to him we had on two businessmen we had on one guy that does wealth management for billionaires uh he has non competes so he can't do wealth management for anyone else like that's how good this guy is and he's sought after we got another guy on that uh, he's, he reconstructs businesses. He goes in, trims the fat and makes them run more efficiently. And you wouldn't believe the, the transfer that these things have to, to strength conditioning and to coaching and to dealing with people. It's, it's very similar concepts. But ju one thing Justice said to us was, I'm going to go back and I'm going to listen to the business podcast because now I'm unemployed and I need to start thinking about budgeting and where my, where my insurance goes or what, what I, what I need to do for retirement. I, we don't know. So this is a strength. This is a podcast that's for people that kind of, kind of in my, my position and your position that are, we're, we're kind of self-sustaining. We need to learn how to do all this stuff. We're, we're the one trick pony and we don't have a lot of money. So these guys that have the multi-million dollar payrolls with the financial planners, they're not going to deal with us. I mean, all my pro guys, their financial planners have like a 10 to $30 million minimum. So that sure shit isn't me. And these are the best of the best. So who am I going to get run of the mill? I don't know. So it's, we, we should educate ourselves on it. So the podcast is strength conditioning, business life for, I, I think coaches, I guess. I don't know. I think that's what we're going towards. Well, it's rad dude. And it's, We'll make sure that we get the, the links up for iTunes and all that in the notes so that people can check it out. But, you know, always great to see you, buddy. And I'm glad you're great and truly appreciate your time being with us today, bro. And I meant what I said when I said CVAPS was my goal, my, my pinnacle. Like, bro, the product that you guys put out, I fucking love it. It's, Thanks, dude. It's awesome. I mean that. Well, appreciate that, man. There's somebody that I, I might know somebody or two that might be able to make that happen too. So we're going to have to, <laughs> let me make some calls and we'll, we'll rock that out, bro. But it, wait until we can get back in person. Hopefully that's 22. Good grief. But 
Yeah, well, that's so another talk. That's probably more like the Cal type of talk that you were talking about. With, <laughs> get, get me going about that. But nah, bro, appreciate you, man. Thanks so much for your time. And we'll be in touch soon. Thank you, brother. Yeah, man. Cheers.